Welcome to the McConnell Center. This year we are undertaking a year-long effort that we are calling Variety Left and Right, Seeking Understanding, Not Conformity. And today we begin a new phase in that project as we begin to explore the origins of modern political thinking on the left and the right that comes from the debates over the French Revolution. And in particular, we are going to be exploring the under, uh, this understanding uh, through the readings, uh, reading of the debates and discussion of the debates between Edmund Burke and Thomas uh, Paine. And that phase today begins with a lecture by John McLeod on the French Revolution itself, and it will continue with lectures on Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, and a series of podcasts where we walk through the two core texts we'll be dealing with. And those are Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. For all of these uh, sessions, we will be using this edition of the Penguin Classics. And the matching Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man, also by um, Penguin Classics. If you want to follow along, and uh, read with us as we go here at the McConnell Center. You can use those two editions and follow along in season six of our podcast, Vital Remnants. I hope you'll, you'll do that. But today we get to start with an overall discussion of the French Revolution and putting it in historic context. Our lecturer today is John McLeod. Dr. McLeod was born in Toronto, Canada. He was educated in Toronto and Athens, Greece. You can't get too farther apart than that probably in the world. And is a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. In 1993, he received his doctoral degree in history from the University of Toronto. And just two years later, he arrived here on the campus of the University of Louisville, where he is a tenured full professor of history. He's also been the department chair for five years and is currently the director of undergraduate studies in history here at the University of Louisville. Is the author or uh, editor of four books. He's a frequent speaker in our community. He's a frequent speaker here at the McConnell Center, and he's certainly a uh, student favorite. His hobbies include genealogy and travel, and it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce and welcome uh, here back to the McConnell Center my, my good friend, John McLeod. John? Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Well, I think a good place to start is to say that the French Revolution, despite the way its name sounds, it's not actually a single revolution. It's a whole series of things that began in 1789, and a lot of historians would say ended 10 years later in 1799. And for my money, the French Revolution is one of a small number of events in world history that really were game changers. And what I want to do today is to set you up for the rest of your program by just giving you a brief introduction, an overview of the French Revolution. There are semester long courses that you can take on the French Revolution. And my lecture today is going to leave out a lot or simplify a lot of topics that I would have loved to go into more detail about. But anyway, here goes. When the French Revolution began in 1789, France was unquestionably a major world power. It was the third largest European country in area, after only Russia and Turkey, and it had 28 million people. You can compare that to Britain, which at that time had about 8 million people, or the United States, that had about 3 million people. And although by then France had lost most of its North American colonies, those colonies at one time extended from the maritime provinces of Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico in Louisiana, Mississippi, the Florida Panhandle. Now, although France had lost most of its North American colonies, it still did have colonies all over the world. And just a sort of brief overview, these included, for example, Saint-Domingue uh, in the Caribbean, which is now Haiti, and at that time was the world's largest sugar producer. Gorée, which is now part of Senegal in Africa, and it was a major center of the slave trade. 
and the source of a lot of the enslaved Africans who worked the sugar plantations in Saint-Domingue. And Pondicherry in India, Pondicherry remained part of France until 1954. So France had a large colonial empire. And from the 1640s until the 1750s, France was by far the most powerful country in Europe. Then came the uh, French and Indian War, or Seven Years' War, uh, and the French and Indian War uh, ended in a British victory in 1763, and after that, Britain replaced France as the dominant power in Europe. Although the French did get some revenge for the Seven Years' War in the American Revolution, as you probably know, during the Revolution, France gave us massive amounts of aid, played an important part in us finally defeating the British. So now let's look at France itself before the Revolution. And we often refer to the social and political structure of France before 1789 as the Old Regime or Ancien Regime. And in this context, Old Regime or Ancien Regime can best be translated as simply Old System. And the Old System, the Ancien Regime, has various components. One of them is the system of government. The system of government in the Old Regime is called absolute monarchy or absolutism. And this is a system of government in which the administration is headed by a king. And in theory, the king has absolute power. He makes all the decisions. He doesn't need input from anyone. And all government employees have to do what the king says. Now, we sometimes think that that's how kings always were. But that wasn't actually the case during most of European history. Kings in France and in other European countries historically had to share their power with a whole bunch of other people, with religious leaders, with local power brokers whom we call nobles, uh, with uh, town councils that ran major cities. And in many cases, a lot of these elements were actually more powerful than the kings. And absolutism or absolute monarchy was largely created during the 1600s by a king called Louis XV. Louis XV was king of France from 1643 until 1715. And if you do the math, you'll see that that's 72 years. That's longer even than Queen Elizabeth was queen of the United Kingdom. And this makes Louis XIV the longest reigning king in European history. And essentially, Louis XIV sidelined other sources of power and made himself the absolute ruler of France. And kings and rulers in many other European countries followed Louis's lead and they transitioned their governments into absolutism. One of the few countries where that didn't happen was Britain, where by the mid-18th century, the king normally let politicians run the government. But in places like Spain, Russia, the German states, absolutism held sway. So Louis XIV, who creates absolutism or absolute monarchy, is king of France for 72 years. And after he dies, he's followed by his son, Louis XV, who's king for another 59 years. And then Louis XV, when he dies, he's followed by his grandson, Louis XVI. And Louis XVI is the king for whom the city of Louisville is named. There used to be a statue down on Jefferson Street of Louis, the, Louis XVI. Now, by the time of Louis XVI, a problem with absolute monarchy is coming into being. And that's that it depends on the person at the top being pretty good at the job. Because whatever his faults, Louis XIV was decisive and he was fairly intelligent. Louis XV was less capable. And by the time we get to Louis XVI, he was a nicer man than the previous two leaders, uh, but he was a weak king. And Louis XVI had an added problem in the person of his wife. His wife is a woman called Queen Marie Antoinette. And Marie Antoinette was from Austria. In fact, her mother was a woman who ruled Austria for 40 years, a woman called Maria Theresa. And the problem with this was that Austrians were unpopular in France. For a hundred years, Austria and France had been deadly enemies. They officially became allies in 1756, but there were still a lot of strains. And Marie Antoinette was seen by a lot of people in France as not only having the liability of being Austrian, she was also seen as being shallow and spoiled, and she seemed to spend most of her time either spending money or playing with her children. She wasn't doing the hard work that being a queen was supposed to entail. One more thing about the French government. For most of France's history, the capital city of France has been Paris. But in 1682, for political reasons, King Louis XIV left Paris and he moved to the town of Versailles, 15 miles away. And 
since the King of France lived at Versailles, that meant that under the system of absolute monarchy, Versailles was effectively the capital of France. And here we have a picture of Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette and their three children. Uh, so you can see they're a nice happy couple, but maybe not necessarily the right people for those jobs. So the king and his family are at the very top in the system of the Ancien Regime. And the rest of French society, the other 28 million people, uh, was divided into three very clearly defined groups. And these three groups are sometimes called the three estates. Technically, that term only applied at election time. We're going to see what that means in a moment. But it's a convenient shorthand for the three groups in society. And at the very top of this system, there is what we call the first estate. And the first estate consists of clergy of the Roman Catholic Church. Everybody from the bishops, the pope's regional managers in France, down to the ordinary parish clergy and village churches. And the Catholic clergy in France numbered altogether about 130,000 people but they were in a very favored position. The Catholic Church owned about 10% of all the land in France, and Catholic clergy had various special privileges. For example, they were exempted from many taxes. Uh, that included the most important source of government revenue, a tax called the tie. The tie was a tax on the amount of land you owned. And since the Catholic Church owned 10% of the land in France, the fact that clergy didn't have to pay for it, uh, pay pay the tie, that meant a big hole in the government revenues. So that's the clergy who form the first estate. Then there's the second estate. And the second estate are the people that we call nobles, dukes, barons, counts, and so on. And they're altogether about 350,000 people who fall into that category. And the nobles had been the local rulers in much of France until the creation of absolute monarchy. Uh, I mentioned that one type of noble were people called counts, for example, and the territory that historically was ruled by a count was known as a county. That's where we get that term from. Now, although the nobles had lost their control of local politics in France during the 17th century, in 1789 they were still very wealthy, and they tended to dominate top positions in the government, in the military, in the legal profession, in the Catholic Church. And like Catholic clergy, nobles were exempted from paying many taxes, including the tie. At the same time, that being said, a lot of the nobles were discontented. Some of them simply wanted to turn the clock back to the time before absolute monarchy when they were the real local leaders. There were other nobles who were influenced by the thought coming out of what we call the Enlightenment. Uh, and one example of this is someone you've probably heard of, Lafayette. Uh, the Enlightenment was an intellectual movement that said we can use reason to come up with the right answers to almost anything. And that included the government. And nobles who were influenced by the Enlightenment, they see absolutism as an irrational form of government. They want to move the government to something that seems more rational. Um, Lafayette, who was a general in the American Revolution, he was sort of like George Washington's adopted son, and he was a noble who held this view. Uh, here we have a picture of Lafayette's first meeting with Washington. And as you probably know, Fayette County, Kentucky is named after him. That's a tribute to the role that he played in American history. So that's the nobles, the second estate. And then finally, there's the third estate. And the third estate is everybody else. Anybody who is not royal or a Catholic clergyman or a noble counts as third estate. So we're talking about close to 28 million people. But the third estate is a very diverse sort of group. The largest element in the third estate are what we call peasants. People sometimes think of peasant as being a derogatory word for a poor person, but actually it means a farmer. And the peasants or farmers formed about 75 to 80% of France's population. But often their farms were very small. And there were all kinds of restrictions on the peasants' lives. Um, legally, for example, in many cases they had to defer to local nobles. Uh, local nobles, as just one example, would often own the only flour mill in the village. And just to be able to grind your wheat, to be able to make bread, you would have to go and use the noble's flour mill and you'd have to pay him for it. And this was a legal thing. You couldn't build your own flour mill or anything like that. You have to do that. So those are the peasants, the largest element of the third estate. Then there are urban wage earners, skilled craftsmen, shopkeepers, people like that. And by the 1780s, the urban wage earners are often feeling a pinch. Prices are rising faster than their wages. And then there's what is called the bourgeoisie. 
The word bourgeoisie literally just means anybody who lives in a city or town. But in France in 1789, it's specifically used for what we would call white collar, upper middle class people. Merchants, industrialists, bankers, doctors, lawyers. And the bourgeoisie with their families altogether number about 2.3 million people or a little less than 10% of France's total population. And very often members of the bourgeoisie were quite wealthy, but they were resentful of the higher status of the nobles. They were angry because under the system of absolute monarchy, their wealth does not translate into political power. And like the nobles, members of the bourgeoisie are often influenced by enlightenment thought. They would like to replace absolutism with something they see as being more rational. So that's the structure of French society. Now, as far as France's economy is concerned, the French economy rests at this time on agriculture and on worldwide trade. And from the 1730s to the 1780s, France, the French economy really is booming. People are doing well. But then an economic downturn hits. 1787 and 1788, for example, see bad harvests. These drive up the price of food. Manufacturing is hit by a depression. Unemployment strikes. And the poor, who we can say form about a third of the population, are especially hard hit. And on top of this economic crisis, by the late 1780s, the French government is running out of money. Now, there was a common idea that this was simply due to government waste. But a lot of it was actually the inevitable result of just trying to uphold France's position in the world. So, for example, I mentioned that France played a crucial role in the American Revolution, which ended in 1783, uh, but that was really expensive to France. And eventually, by the late 1780s, it's clear that the French government is going to run out of money unless something can be done soon. And the economists decide that the only solution is a complete overhaul of the French taxation system. But here there's a problem. Even though the king of France, in theory, is the absolute monarch, even though in theory he can do anything he wants, Legally, taxation is one thing that he cannot touch. Legally, the king cannot overhaul taxation on his own. Changes of something like taxation have to be approved by a body that is called the Estates General. And the Estates General was the ancient French lawmaking body comparable to the United States Congress. So it has got the sole right to overhaul the taxation system. And here's where the problem comes in. The Estates General had not met since 1614. That was when France, we can say, had begun its transition to absolutism. And so the last session of the Estates General had been in 1614. But to get the tax reforms through, the Estates General has to be brought back to life. And so in 1788, the fall of 1788, King Louis XVI announces that France is going to have its first elections in 175 years. Now, there's only a limited number of voters. Only wealthy men can vote. But during the election campaign, everyone gets caught up in the excitement, and people air all sorts of grievances. And by the time the election results come in, in the spring of 1789, it's clear that the Estates General will have to deal with much more than simply tax reform. So the elections take place, and the representatives are elected. Among those who are elected, to the Estates General is our friend Lafayette, Washington's sort of stepson. And once the elections are completed, King Louis XVI officially opens the Estates General at Versailles, the place where he lives, on May the 5th, 1789. And here you can see a picture of the Estates General at its meeting. You can see the Catholic clergy on the left in the sort of colorful robes, representatives of the, of the Third Estate in black in the middle, and then on the far side, representatives of the nobles. Now, as soon as the Estates General holds its first meeting on May the 5th, 1789, a procedural problem immediately comes up. I mentioned the three estates of French society. And each of these three estates, the voters of each of these three estates, would elect their own chamber in the Estates General. So the Estates General historically had three chambers. We, of course, have got two chambers in our federal system, the Senate and the House. The Estates General historically had three chambers, one with the representatives of the first estate, the Catholic clergy, one with the representatives of the second estate, the nobles, and one with the representatives of the third estate. And in the 1789 elections, the first two estates each elected 289 representatives, and then the third estate 
or at least eligible voters from the third estate, elected 578 representatives. So together, the first and second estates have got the same number of representatives as the third estate. So after the opening of the Estates General takes place, a debate is held on how it should vote. Traditionally, the chambers representing the three estates had each met and voted separately. And for a measure to pass into law, it had to be approved by two of the three estates. Now, most of the representatives of the clergy and the nobles want to keep that system because that will let them decide what passes. But there's a general consensus in the representatives of, representatives of the third estate that rather than having the three groups meeting separately, all the members of the Estates General who have just been elected should meet together in a joint session. And the idea here is that some members of the clergy and some members of the nobility will side with the third estate. So that will allow the third estate to call the shots to set the agenda. So the procedural debate essentially is who's ultimately going to be in charge, the clergy and the nobles or the third estate. Now there's also another issue. King Louis XVI tries to keep the focus on tax reform, but he's unsuccessful. And on June the 17th, 1789, about a month and a half after the Estates General opens, representatives of the third estate announce, we can pass laws on our own. We represent the vast majority of the French population. We do not need the approval of the representatives of the clergy and the nobles. And so the representatives of the third estate say we can make any laws that we want, and they say we're going to use a new name now. We don't want to be called the third estate anymore. We want to be called the National Assembly. And the idea here is that these are the representatives of the French nation who are going to be assembled together. Now the National Assembly says that if they want, the representatives of the clergy and the nobles can join in with them in a joint session. But they say their presence is not necessary. We alone, the National Assembly, can make all decisions for France. And the National Assembly then sort of throws down a challenge to King Louis XVI. Remember the King wanted to keep the focus on tax reform. But the National Assembly says that rather than tax reform, our top priority is going to be writing a constitution for France. And their goal is to transform France from an absolute monarchy into what we call a limited monarchy or a constitutional monarchy. That's on the British model. And the idea here is that France will still have a king but like King George III in Britain at that time, he won't be actively running the government. The government will be run by politicians. So this is what the National Assembly has now declared. And this throws the ball into the court of King Louis XVI. Because there's a question here. Is the king going to go along with what the National Assembly says? Is the king going to agree that the National Assembly on its own can pass laws? Uh, or is he going to say they have to follow procedure uh, so the representatives of the estates, each of them meet separately. And is the king going to go along with the idea of constitutional reform, or is he going to say stick with taxes? And for several weeks, there's debate and argument as to what's going to happen next. The king plays his cards very carefully. And eventually rumors begin to spread that King Louis XVI is going to come out against the National Assembly. That in fact he may use force to arrest and imprison the members of the National Assembly. Now we still don't know whether those rumors are true, but people get very excited about it. And this includes people in Paris, the traditional capital and the largest city in France. And on, the on July the 14th, 1789, a large crowd of protesters gathers outside a building called the Bastille. And the Bastille is an old castle in downtown Paris. And you can see the Bastille there in the middle of this picture. Now the Bastille at this time is not used as a traditional castle. It's used as a French government building and it's used for several purposes. One of its purposes and the reason that the protesters gather there is that the government of France uses it to store gunpowder. And the crowd of protesters want to get their hands on this gunpowder. They want to be able to fight back if the king actually decides to crack down on the National Assembly. But the Bastille also has got other purposes. And it's best known because besides being used to store gunpowder, it's also used as a prison. Now it's sort of like what we would consider to be a low level security federal prison. It only has got eight prisoners, all of them are well treated, and they're seen as being such a low level threat that they're guarded by disabled veterans. And the total prisoners to show the type of people there are, two of them are sex offenders, 
Uh, one of them is the Marquis de Sade, who was well known for writing pornographic works that have got sexual sed sadistic scenes in them. Uh, there's also four forgers and two insane old men. And that's the sum total of people in the Bastille. But there's a popular belief that secretly the Bastille is used to house political prisoners. And the crowd of protesters, besides wanting the gunpowder, they believe that there are probably hundreds and hundreds of people secretly being held there who are against King Louis XVI. And for several hours, the protesters negotiate with the commander of the Bastille to try to get him to hand over the gunpowder. But he says, I can't give you the gunpowder without authorization. And eventually the protesters attack the castle. And they break into the castle, they kill the commander and several of the disabled guards, they free the prisoners, and they eventually dismantle the whole of the Bastille. And this event, the attack on the Bastille, is seen as marking the beginning of the French Revolution. As you may know, the day that happened, July the 14th, is still France's national day, known as Bastille Day, the French equivalent of the 4th of July. Now, during the attack on the Bastille, something very important had happened. Several units of soldiers had joined the protesters. And King Louis XVI realizes that's a really bad sign for him. It means that he can't trust the army. And so the king at this point backs down and he recognizes the National Assembly as having the sole power to make laws for France. And so the National Assembly now can do what it wants. And it immediately sets things in motion. The National Assembly quickly abolishes the special rights for clergy and for nobles, abolishes their tax exemptions and other special privileges. Now, one of the results of this is that it quickly turns most nobles against what is going on. And then the National Assembly moves on. On August 26, 1789, it adopts a document that is called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And this enshrines various rights in it that historically people in France had not had. It enshrines, for example, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. It also declares that all men are equal, all men have equal rights, and that includes all men have the right to take part in making laws. Now note that it is all men. Uh, there's a prominent feminist in France at this time, a woman called Olympe de Gouges, and she follows up with her own document called the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. She calls for equality of women, but the National Assembly ignores this. But after passing the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, the National Assembly carries out further reforms. For example, I mentioned that the Catholic Church had owned 10% of all the land in France. That land is now confiscated by the National Assembly and it's auctioned off. The following year in 1790, the National Assembly passes a law that transforms clergy into paid government officials with bishops and priests being elected. And this begins to turn the Catholic Church against what's going on as well. And finally in 1791, the National Assembly completes its new constitution and it transforms France into a constitutional monarchy. Louis XVI is still going to be king, but the power to make laws and to enforce them, oh, there's a picture of a lamp de gouge, I'm sorry, missed that. Uh, the power to make laws and to enforce them is transferred from the king to an elected body called the Legislative Assembly. And the Legislative Assembly is going to be elected by 50,000 wealthy voters, mostly members of the bourgeoisie. So again, we're sort of sidelining the position of the nobles and the clergy. Now, a lot of people are beginning to get concerned about this. Within France, the nobles and the Catholic Church already don't like what's going on. The king doesn't like what's going on either. And finally, in June of 1791, King Louis XVI and his family decide to leave the country. And they disguise themselves and uh, they uh, are captured. They're brought back to Paris. Um, where they're kept, there's the king being captured with his family. Uh, they're captured, they're brought back to Paris, and uh, they're not allowed to return to Versailles. And within France, there's a lot of resentment that all that has happened is that a new group of elites have taken over from the king. Uh, nobles and clergy feel that that's all that's happened. The members of the bourgeoisie and the legislative assembly are in charge. And there's the, there's the emergence of groups that are called clubs, they use the English word for it, which call for more radical change. One of these is a club called the Jacobins, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So there's a lot of opposition within France to all of these changes, which are now reaching a point where they really are revolutionary, and so we can say what's going on is the French Revolution. Meanwhile, absolute monarchs in other European countries are also worried about the French Revolution, 
they're worried that it's going to spread to their territories. And in the spring of 1792, Austria and Prussia, which are the two most powerful states in what's now Germany, uh, they both go to war with France in the spring of 1792. And French troops are losing in this struggle. And many people in France feel that the king is not fully behind the French war effort. And in August of 1792, anger against King Louis XVI boils over. Protesters attack his residence and they imprison him. And they then go to the legislative assembly, the governing body, and they force the legislative assembly to agree that the French people can decide on what the next stage is. And the decision on the next stage is not going to be made by the National Assembly, uh, the Legislative Assembly. It's going to be made by a body called the National Convention. And the National Convention is going to be something that has never existed in the whole history of the world. It's going to be a body that is going to be elected by all adult men. Because keep in mind that in the United States at that time, in ancient Greece, in Britain, the right to vote was limited. Only a small part of the population could vote. But the National Convention is going to be elected by all adult men. And the elections for the National Convention are quickly held. And most of the people who are elected to it are young lawyers and other professionals. They tend to be very radical in their outlook. And the National Convention holds its first meeting in September 1792. And it becomes very clear very quickly that there's a lot of anger and hatred towards King Louis XVI. And so the very first step the National Convention takes is to abolish the monarchy, to say that France will no longer have a king at all. France is now going to be a republic. And because of the danger that there are still people who support Louis XVI, he is to be removed from the scene. So a few months later, King Louis XVI is executed in January 1793. Now the king's execution evokes even more anger. France already had been fighting against Austria and Prussia. Austria and Prussia are now joined by Spain, by Portugal, by Britain, by the Netherlands, by Russia. And what this means is that almost all the European countries that matter are now fighting against France. And this is a grave danger to France. The French army is not doing all that well. And with all these countries piling on against France, there is a danger that France will be defeated. So to meet this challenge, the National Convention transfers all powers of government for one year to a group of 12 men called the Committee of Public Safety. And the Committee of Public Safety will have full powers to do whatever it wants to mobilize France against its enemies. And the Committee of Public Safety quickly comes under the domination of one of its members. And this is a young lawyer by the name of Maximilien de Robespierre. Robespierre was a member of the Jacobin Club, which I mentioned a few moments ago, which wanted very radical changes in France. So Robespierre, here's his picture, is now effectively in charge of France. And Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety carry out several measures which really are unprecedented. In the first place, they draft all young men into the French army. And they also call on all French people to support the military. France is going to be what is called the nation in arms. And what that means is the whole population of France is going to be involved in the war effort. And this works. By 1794, France has got an army of 640,000 men, which was really unheard of in those days. And by 1795, the French army has all of its enemies on the run. Now, the Committee of Public Safety and Robespierre are worried not only about foreign enemies, they're also worried about enemies within France. And their solution to this is what is called the reign of terror. And what this means is to execute any real or potential enemies. And this leads to massive numbers of executions. In the space of nine months, 40,000 people are executed by the French government. Um, about 16,000 of them are executed with a new tool, the guillotine. Guillotine is a sort of contraption that cuts people's heads off. It was seen as being much more humane than previous forms of execution. And in major cities of France, guillotines are set up in the, major, in the town square. And then loads of people all day long are brought up to the guillotine and executed. So here you see the way this process works of these men just being brought up by cart and having their heads cut off. And Robespierre increasingly seems to be becoming paranoid. Um, he sees enemies everywhere. He says that his enemies are like a disease, that they have to be eliminated. So by killing all of these people, this is kind of like cutting off a diseased limb or a cancerous part of the body. And Robespierre, besides dealing with his enemies, both inside France and outside, 
He wants to transform the country in every way. Uh, for example, in the early days of the revolution, France had begun to tra transition from its traditional system of measurement, the French equivalents of inches and pounds and gallons, it had begun to transition to the metric system with centimeters and kilograms and liters. And Robespierre wants to carry out wide-ranging changes. Uh, he wants to, for example, transform religion. He believes that Christianity is an irrational religion, it doesn't make sense, and he develops um, a new religion what is called the cult of the supreme being as a replacement for Christianity. Uh, the cult of the supreme being is a form of deism. Deism was a very popular theology in Europe in the 18th century. Uh, it believes that there is a God, but he doesn't get involved in our lives. So the implications of that are things like miracles don't happen, Jesus was not the son of God who came to earth, and things like that. As Robespierre tries to get the cult of the supreme being as a replacement for Christianity, uh, holds a big festival where people can worship, doesn't really catch on, but that's part of Robespierre's efforts to change things. And then suddenly Robespierre meets with a very dramatic end. In July of 1794, he's scheduled to give a speech in the National Convention. And the expectation is that he's going to call for the deaths of many of his colleagues in the National Convention. And suddenly, somehow, the mood turns against him. And the members of the convention vote to arrest Robespierre. And he is arrested. It's a very sort of chaotic scene. Uh, he's shot during the process, placed under arrest, and he's executed the next day. And after this, things calm down. The reign of terror comes to an end with Robespierre's death. And in 1795, a new constitution is introduced that replaces the National Convention with a body of five men called the Directory. And these five men are sort of like five co-presidents of France. Uh, the most important of the members of the directory is a former noble, a man by the name of Paul Barat. But at the same time, although the French army is doing better, France remains at war with most other countries. There are economic problems. There are some people who want more changes to take place, others who want fewer changes. Nobody is happy. And the five men running the government in the directory are just unable to cope. And they increasingly rely on the army to stay in power. Increasingly, France is veering in the direction of being a military dictatorship, with the army essentially telling the directory, here's what you have to do to stay in power. And in 1799, military power becomes overt. In 1799, 1799 a general by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte carries out a coup. He overthrows the directory and makes himself the ruler of France. And Napoleon dominates France for the next 16 years. And under his leadership, France vanquishes its enemies. Napoleon, for a time, makes France once more the strongest country in Europe. And he continues the transformations that had begun 10 years earlier. But Napoleon's assumption of power in 1799 is conventionally seen as marking the end of the French Revolution. And so I think that that is a good place for me to stop. Thank you, and I hope this provides a good basis for the remainder of your studies on the French Revolution.